Welcome to the Antal Jozef Knowledge Center's Foreign and Security Policy First Hand Lecture Series. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Maximilian Antalaki, who is the president of the Hungarian American Coalition. Tonight he will be speaking about the current Hungarian American relations, the midterm elections in America, and also the American foreign policy. So please welcome Mr. Palki. consequences um, after the post 9-11 era um, and what we seem to call the war on terror, uh, the last six years of the United States really not focusing or having a strategy towards Central and Eastern Europe, at least a strategy that's cohesive. There's a lot of reactive measures in its foreign policy. And regrettably, um, six, seven years ago, uh, as a young democracy, even younger than it is now, countries like Hungary could certainly have used more um, assistance, direct institutional assistance to strengthening um, parts of any democratic society that need to work proper in order to um, be healthy and balanced. And that includes a strong civil society, includes a strong judiciary, includes a great deal of transparency, uh, a great deal of openness and that in the form of media. Um, and some of those investments, or lack of investments, that the United States and others didn't continue to make, um, really after 2007-2008, um, have cost us, I think. And we've seen a resurgence in the last 10 years, in some respects, of 
15 years prior to that of Russia trying to regain its independence and strength and its own stature. So in the last 10 years, we've seen the reemergence of its expanding sphere of influence around the world and certainly in its near um, sphere, uh, namely Central and Eastern Europe and the former republics of the Soviet Union. And the consequences of that are the investments that it's decided to make, uh, both um, transparent and non-transparent, both in business, uh, legitimate and not legitimate business, and the relationships it's built and the structures it's put in place throughout the former Yugoslavia, throughout South Central Europe, Eastern, Northern Europe, and the United States hasn't really reacted to that in a way I think that it could have. Um, and as you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of criticism by the United States about what's going on, uh, particularly under the Orban government um, after the 2010 elections with all the dramatic changes going on with such speed and perhaps in some ways a lack of understanding of what was going on, why it was happening, and a very poor policy and practice of communicating what was going on both to the domestic Hungarian audience as well as the international audience. In fact, there was really no communication strategy. So whether you disagreed with the policy or agreed with the policy, you were simply left to your own assumptions in many cases as to whether something was good or bad. And as a result of that vacuum within the news media-driven political sphere that we live in, uh, it was very easy to be critical. And then on top of that, I think they, were, they made some very poor and, and impulsive decisions that didn't help them. To use a tennis metaphor, there was a lot of unforced errors, uh, unnecessary mistakes, whether one agrees with the particular policies or not. And that has a broader implication on the short, medium, long-term health and future of Hungary and of in the same, in the same degree uh, to its neighbors it, it had experienced similar challenges. But before I get too far into that, I want to just touch a little bit, if I can, on what's going on in the United States. I did so briefly by describing what I believe is a lack of investment or a lack of focus by the United States on um, Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, I certainly think that's the case. I think most people who have spent a lot of time investing um, uh, both political capital and, 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 and business would say that there has not been the kind of support structures that are needed. Um, but earlier this month, we had what's called the midterm election between um, the presidential campaign, which happened every four years, as you probably know. And this was the most expensive midterm election in the history of the United States, close to $4 billion, with the lowest voter turnout of registered voters, roughly 22%. And with the least amount of substance that I can remember in a midterm election in the last 12 years. So basically what you had is people not voting and expressing their discontent um, and then you also had people voting uh, in predominantly what we would call Republican-leaning uh, states or red states where there were senatorial uh, uh, senators that were either up for re-election or potentially had the opportunity to be um, taken by the Republicans. Uh, and they took advantage of the opportunity. Um, seven out of the states were even though there were some Democratic senators from, former Governor Romney um, uh, won those states handedly in 2012 in the national elections by over 12%. Um, the environment is such that finally now, the 
first two years of the Obama government, you had control of the House and the Senate. And since 2010, you've had control only of, this, uh, only of the Senate and only a very small margin of control of the Senate. So I've spoken to many people here and I've been quite struck by the fact that they seem to think that there's this major wave and there's this major shift in the power in, in, um, in Washington and in the United States. And I would suggest that what it is, I hope, is, 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 a, is a positive shift because usually in Washington, if you look historically back at what happens after midterm elections, divided government is usually when compromises are reached and things are done. Whether that's reducing deficits or making investments in infrastructure, <coughs> different things that um, all parties can agree on. And then making compromises where they need to make compromises in order to get things done. Because the Republican Party no longer can afford to be the party that is simply against what the Democrats do because now they control both chambers of Congress. And so that is a benefit to the Democrats going into the 2016 elections because they have the ability to run against someone. Um, also, one needs to really look at the approval ratings of Democrats and Republicans, period, for the president or in Congress. Um, the historic lows of this president's approval rating are consequential, no question. Um, but uh, the Republicans are 20% below that. So 37% approval rating by the president, 16, 17% by the Republicans, Congress overall 11%, Democrats 19 It's a pretty grim picture. What that means is that the country in general, voters in general, are pretty apathetic, pretty uninterested and disappointed with, with how their government is working or not working. And I think this is a phenomenon we see in many countries. Uh, there's people that are just you know, tired of the ruling class politically and them not being responsive to the needs of the average citizen and what that means to overall governance. So, specifically, what's going on between the United States and Hungary? Well, you're here, you've been reading, I'm sure, and studying. Um, fireworks going on in the press, some of it fact, some of it fiction, um, and uh, I'm here for 12 days. I come frequently, and part of what I try to do here is to listen, so I've been talking to a lot of people and asking them questions. Um, before I left to come here, I did the same. When I was asked by people in the U.S. government, and what's going on in Hungary? I said, well, this is what you get when you neglect, you know, an ally for five years. Um, that's pretty strong, maybe not entirely fair, but um, I think it's, it's certainly an argument that can be made. Um, the biggest question that I'll touch upon is this issue of the uh, visa ban, for example completely misunderstood by the Hungarian public, in my opinion. People look at the legal mechanism that's used by this presidential proclamation. There's 12 European countries that actually have similar um, proclamations. Four in Central Europe. Now this isn't confirmed because it's all confidential. But this is pretty much what's understood by many cases. And the US Embassy, in this case, informed the government um, of the particular situation and expressed uh, the reason why these individuals, without naming names, but the Hungarian government well aware of the possibility of certain people on this list, um, naturally so, communications and skilled security personnel who are what they are know that there's very few secrets in this regard. 
So how did the story become public? And why doesn't the US disclose the names? Well, the story became public because the Prime Minister's office made it public. The embassy didn't make it public. I'm not defending them. I'm just saying that they didn't have a legal right to make it public. Only those that were on the list have a right to make it public. Now, um, the evidence is something that the Hungarian government already has. So kind of the theatrics of showing a piece of paper and waving it really doesn't you know, um, get to the point. What's important is, is that a poisonous element in any democratic society is when institutions are weak enough that corruption can penetrate them at different levels, whether it's on a bus or a bio policeman on the corner, or when you're trying to get a permit for a building or renovating a house or whatever it is. And then of course when you do larger business transactions with the government um, or if you're a foreign investor, you have certain challenges. So there's plenty of room for pointing the finger at the United States and having them look in the mirror with regard to their own electoral policies, corruption that exists in the US electoral system, you know, the amount of money that's spent, that's absurdly spent on presidential and his last campaigns, access or inaccess of eligible voters to their constitutional right to vote, you know, um, money in politics, the length of the presidential campaign, all of these things. There's plenty of hypocrisy in, uh, in, in much of the U.S. policy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, uh, a mature democracy that's clearly imperfect, but has had success and has a rather important role in the world, shouldn't try to influence its allies and express concerns. The question is, how those concerns are expressed. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration can lie within the Hungarian public. And it makes it a little dangerous, in my opinion, because it makes the US seem kind of like a bully sometimes. Maybe that they're expressing an opinion in a way that's not very empathetic to the political and economic environment here. Um, and also, I think it's important because uh, the U.S. often doesn't listen as much as it should, and that's just a byproduct, I think, of being the country that it is and the way that they operate. It's not necessarily a Republican or Democratic way of government. It's a, uh, I think, a cultural way of interacting. It's the politics of diplomacy. It's a stick. Um, the other thing I would say before taking questions is that uh, I'm very optimistic about Hungary's future. I'm very optimistic about um, the 21st century and about the U.S. role in the world. Um, and maybe part of it is naive because Americans are naturally more optimistic than Hungarians. Um, but I am half Hungarian, so I have a certain degree of pessimism. <laughs> and I am uh, also half Argentine, where they have uh, a very high per capita rate of psychoanalysis, so um, you can see my conflict. Um, but uh, I think there is more good in a relationship than bad. There is more strength and weakness between the people of Hungary and the region uh, and the United States and the American people than bad. There are greater cultural ties and historic ties than not. And people need to put this into perspective. And I think that the debates need to be discussed in a political environment, in a diplomatic environment, in a much more healthy fashion than they have been in the last few years 
certainly in the last few weeks. And I think if that's done, if steps are taken, then we can see uh, improvement in relations. That's what I work on, that's what others work on, who I work with. Um, that's what uh, I believe deep down both people in both countries wish. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. My question is related to this mid-term and uh, Hungarian uh, nurse relationship. Uh, what do you think that, uh, that the domest domestic politics is chanting, like as we can see that Rep Republics, uh, Republicans, they are dominant in the United States now. Do you think that uh, that uh, will cause uh, some change in orientation of foreign policy, US foreign policy towards Hungary? By taking into account that uh, Prime Minister of Hungary is uh, stand towards, I mean, like, uh, certain uh, issues is not quite, like, friendly towards the United States. It's, like, quite friendly towards, uh, I, would, I would just put it, uh, towards Russia. So what do you think that that uh, change, domestic change in the politics in the United States may change from this uh, foreign, foreign policy? Uh, let me try to answer this way. Um, there's a very unfortunate misconception here that somehow Republicans and the Democrats view um, policy towards Hungary or U.S. policy <coughs> towards Russia or Central Eastern Europe or Ukraine much differently. In fact, if there were a Republican in the White House right now, you would probably see much stronger language and a much more forceful and consistent um, concern um, about what Hungary is or is not doing with regard to Russia, whether it's energy or whether it's uh, other issues. And it would express concern over the um, comments about the sanctions on Ukraine, supporting them and criticizing them. Um, so I think um, that's a misconception. You know, I don't think there'll be any change in the foreign policy towards um, Towards, towards Hungary, um, uh, that doesn't mean that necessarily if in 2016 the Republican is elected that there won't be an opportunity to change the tone <coughs> and maybe the way uh, uh, Hungary is approached. Um, so, you know, fresh faces and fresh ideas sometimes can add you know, an opportunity, but the policy itself ultimately is, is uh, there's really not that much difference. Um, and we can see that based on the bipartisan comments coming from the House and the Senate or international um, experts in the United States that specialize in Central Eastern Europe or Russia. Um, hello, my name is Dominic Diecki, and um, I have two questions, if I can. Um, the first one is, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask such thing. If not, then I'm really sorry, but um, I'd like to be interested in how uh, could you get on this list, and uh, what um, might have they done in order to be on this list. And my second question is that, uh, will the uh, United States uh, take further actions um, with and in connection with Hungary, or will they stop now? I mean, will they take further actions? Uh, your la your first name is Dominic. What's your last name? Yeah. Oh, you're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I recognized you. Um, uh, I have. I have no idea. I, I think that, uh, as I said before, there's a real misunderstanding about this list. You know, the list exists in many parts of the world, in many different specific countries, and um, uh, uh, there are exemptions for, for individuals that might be otherwise denied a visa if they are in an official capacity or going to a specific function the General Assembly of the United Nations or a bilateral meeting in Washington. So it's really the individual itself who can acknowledge their 
themselves to be on this list or not. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to be on the list. Um, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a serious matter. I mean, um, um, as I said, there's, you know, there's, there's four countries in Central Europe and at least another seven in, in, um, in Europe itself, more broadly, that have these types of lists. Um, and their expressions of concern. Um, other countries have these lists with certain American individuals. Um, uh, it's not an uncommon thing. The question is how it is used in the political dialogue. Um, I think one of the, the challenges is, for me anyway, as I see as, as an analyst, let's see if I can answer this correctly, is that, is that the United States runs the risk in some ways as it becomes more vocal, um, not so much as a question of the list, because I think the answers have been relatively restrained, and they've fallen within the parameters of both international and US law regarding the proclamation. But that doesn't mean that it isn't dangerous. Um, it doesn't mean that it isn't challenging for the embassy or a particular person in the embassy to participate as an observer even in the protest. Um, and if that can somehow affect the opinion of that government, in this case the United States, especially when there's a weak opposition. With a weak opposition, it's natural that they can gravitate towards someone who's receiving attention. In this case, the deputy chief of mission of the US Embassy. And I think there's, there is some danger to that. Um, and that's not probably a good thing, and certainly not something that they, they want. They don't want to be considered the opposition. They don't want to be considered the bad guy. Um, they want to deliver a message. And there's an expression in English saying, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Try to listen to the message. Um, but it's challenging. And as, uh, social and economic challenges continue to face Hungarians, especially outside of Budapest. One of the challenges that I think is that you see uh, the strengthening of, of the far right, Jovic, um, and the fact that they're really redirecting their own political strategy towards less uh, anti-Semitism and less anti-Roma. I'm not saying that they're not less of those but they're not talking about it as much. They're focusing on um, educational and social policy issues. Um, and that's a challenge. Uh, you know, um, it's a challenge for this country if they continue to be popular, given their broader uh, political views and their participation in the European uh, far-right parliamentary faction, which is something that should concern everyone about all of Europe. Um, so I have concerns about the U.S. kind of being viewed as uh, an, an opposition in a way. Um, but for example, the protests last night, um, you know, I, I viewed it as a pretty healthy thing. You know, People were upset, whether they, you agree with them or not, and they went out and they expressed their discontent. Um, now, I don't agree with them. If, uh, and I thought, actually, the, the, the police were quite restrained, um, which is a good thing, because clearly, you know, you get more attention if you have a, 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 a clash in many ways. Um, but I think it's a very healthy thing. It shows something, you know, Hungarian people are upset. They're out there expressing their views. And many of the comments that I heard on um, English language media, you know, on the internet, coming from protesters was issue their concerns about corruption. And not with this government, but with the governments of, of the last 10 years. Um, so that's important that Hungarians express their their constitutional rights and their, their rights to free speech and <coughs> freedom of assembly if they have a problem. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think that the key is participating in you know, and democracy not being passive. 
you know, if you want change, you have to be part of it. It's not going to come without working. Inspiring forward. Uh, I really hope I'm also not on that list. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, my question is, I think you were really critical about assessing how the uh, foreign policy of the United States have been disengaging from centralist in Europe, and I was wondering if you, uh, if you would agree or disagree that uh, I think there is quite a strong disengagement on the part of the central and eastern Europe as well towards the United States after the NATO-European uh, integration or the integration of these countries into the NATO European alliance system. Uh, don't you don't you think that maybe uh, we are we are the one to blame as well for not being able to uploading our preferences to the United States after we have been uh, formally part of of this Western alliance. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, thank you. I mean that's that's fair. I mean I think that there was a letter, an open letter in two thousand nine, July I think written by former foreign ministers uh, and uh, cabinet members and, and, and even foreign, former heads of state, I think, in Central Eastern Europe, an open letter to the President of the United States, who had only been in office, I think, for six months, expressing concern about, you know, what is your policy? What is your strategy? What are your interests towards Central Eastern Europe? Because they really did not know. And those embassies <coughs> were largely empty. Was an ambassador in five Central European countries at the time, and I remember discussing this with U.S. policymakers and them feeling rather defensive and saying, "You know, these are you know, young democracies, but they're pretty mature democracies. They should be able to 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 uh, um, handle certain things on their own." And I, my view was, is that you know, you never can communicate too much. Um, certainly privately, and express uh, um, what your policy and what your intentions are. Um, they made, this is the Obama government, made rather <coughs> dramatic changes in the um, Central Europe uh, missile defense policy. Um, and they did so in the se September of 2009. And they announced that there would be changes to the policy, specifically in Poland, on the anniversary of the Soviet invasion of Poland. Pretty dumb mistake. Um, now, um, I'm an unapologetic, uh, well, that's not much. I'm, uh, uh, I've, I've been a lifelong Democrat, uh, and I've worked for Republicans and Democrats. But, um, you know, I try to be objective as a, as an analyst and as a as a as someone who wants to see my country do the right things. And I also want to see Hungary do the right things. So I think that um, you're right that, that Hungary has had opportunities to focus more on the West. Um, but I also I, I think one of the things that that I find striking is that you know in the energy debate about South Stream um, uh, you know, this is basically a transit mechanism for Hungary. You know, they might get some of this. <coughs> I don't see a lot of criticism, you know, out of Brussels and out of Washington towards the French and the Germans. I mean, with the Serbs, you know, with regard to the amount of money and influence and energy. Uh, so, I do think that there is perhaps a lack of balance and equity with regard to U.S. focusing on Hungary and not perhaps on the Poles finishing the last, you know, several hundred kilometers, several thousand kilometers, excuse me, of the LNG pipeline terminal to be connected. Hungary has enormous storage capacity, um, and it's also bought back shares to, to make sure it controls more with the oil company. Um, and it's provided reverse flow of gas to Ukraine. It's provided gas also to Bulgaria and Croatia at times. So I think there's some misconceptions with regard to, to what 
people think <coughs> Hungary has or has not done. Um, at the same time, what I don't appreciate and what I find very dangerous is that when you're an ally, which refers usually to military alliance, in this case NATO, and you're a member of the European Union, uh, that you um, support sanctions and the next day you criticize them. And there's a lot of contradictory messages. So what I hope and I see from this government, throughout the government, is a consistent um, expression of what really uh, believes in what it wants. Um, it's great that you know there are speeches made by the foreign minister and the prime minister and others about you know its uh, dedication to Western values. But then the next day, if there's criticism about um, what's going to happen in Ukraine or not, um, and that's a problem. Although the last couple of days, I've heard some, some, some positive speeches. So I'm cautiously optimistic. The president, uh, the prime minister's remarks uh, last Friday at the 25th anniversary of Amcham, very constructive. Uh, president Otto's remarks in Prague, also supportive of, of uh, Ukraine, very important. Uh, we need to, to see this consistently. Yeah, and it be followed up not just by words, but by deeds. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think there's a point in American diplomacy, or, or not just American, more in broad, broad terms, investment diplomacy, where they say that they no longer believe any words that uh, our prime minister says, or what Senator Williams say, because well, they usually contradict themselves. Uh, what they do and abroad and what their domestic policies are. And uh, can you imagine, okay, it will never be uh, said or expressed formally, of course, but they no longer feel that they have any obligation to believe what, what they say in, in a foreign, foreign affair or foreign uh, diplomatic circles? I mean, um, there's politics and everything in universities. Uh, <coughs> local governments and you know, international relations, certainly. And the politics of diplomacy are tricky. Uh, they're not always consistent. Um, but I think the United States uh, reserves judgment based on the actions, not so much the words, although it may very well not like the words at certain times, and express concern about that. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't see that as being a major um, Good evening, my name is Jordan Patrick and uh, my question is that what, what do you think was what was the aim of uh, the United States to to make this list right now? Because some people say that uh, maybe the problem of the United States is that that they see that uh, the Hungary is cooperating not only with the, with the West but also with uh, Russia and some so they are, so Hungary is working with both sides and uh, some people say that the, the problem of the United States is that Hungary is not only connected to the United States but for other sides too. Um, well, I, again, the presumption of your question is why the United States present this list. Um, and what is the motivation behind it? Um, I don't know. But what I do know is that they had no legal ability or right to disclose the list uh, and who's on the list. And the Hungarian government disclosed who's on the list. Uh, excuse me, disclosed the list. So, um, now, one could be kind of Machiavellian about it and say that, well, the United States thought that the Hungarian government may surely not have resisted the opportunity to you know, create a media story about the list existing. But the existence of the list was not disclosed by the US. 
uh, in the public. It was private. Five, six days later, it was disclosed um, by Hungary. So that's neither whether I'm supportive of the idea behind the list or not um, is not a good question. You know, so we have to understand the mechanism of what happens and, and, and why it happened. Uh, or is it constructive? Um, I think it, it's constructive if you look at it more broadly the fact that there's these lists um, that are privately disclosed to governments throughout the world that does a lot of business with the United States and they say we have some concerns about these officials. We have evidence to suggest that they've been involved in illegal activities. And we know that you know this. And you know that we know you know this. <laughs> so, 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 kind of the, the theatrics of saying, you know, tell us who's on the list and show us the proof. There, you know, you know, it's 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 unnecessary theater. It's adding too much, I think, to um, a negative uh, engagement, um, and it's not really good for the U.S. and it's not not good for Hungary. And what do you think about the second part of the question that uh, Hungary is both uh, dealing with uh, the United States and uh, Russia? So what do you think there was? What can be that fact? What do you think it could be fact, uh, the connection with uh, the United States and Hungary? Well, I mean, I think that it's it's understandable that, that, that Hungary needs to deal with Russia as a trading partner. It's, um, not uh, inappropriate. Personally, I don't think I mean, it's understandable. The question is how. How is that relationship? You know, is it a you know, more than just a cordial, purely business relationship, or is there what else is going on there? Um, after the initial announcement of the South Stream, I think you know you saw then Prime Minister Grushin at a soccer match or something next to Putin. Um, this was in. November of 2007, 2008, I don't remember exactly the year. Um, and that was a problem uh, because he had said that there was no deal and that there was a deal. Um, so a lot of it is in the process, and I think the, the optics, the theatrics of it, you know, what you say and how you say it, and what you do in terms of business and how you do it. The United States believes that. Um, it um, has a legal and moral obligation based on the charter of NATO, as do other members of NATO, to protect all of these countries. Um, and all these countries are supposed to protect all the other countries. And that alliance has served the world well, I think. Um, and Hungary is a part of that alliance. So it has formally chosen 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago now, its side, and not the side of its former occupiers. So it is a little bit concerning when it appears to be too friendly with um, a country that is uh, making questionable uh, actions around the world, illegally invading you know, Ukraine um, and Crimea and doing many other things like military exercises very close to the border uh, and off the coast of the Baltics. You know, military aircraft exercises in the Gulf of Mexico and off the coast of California. We're somehow bringing naval vessels to the coast of Australia for President Putin's security. It's a little crazy. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's a, uh, an effect we're not yet seeing on the weakening of the Russian economy as a result of the sanctions. There's a consequence um, of, of this effect. But what we need is we need the allies to be united with regard to sanctions. I mean, I was very pleased to hear the very strong words of Chancellor Merkel. Um, so I think 
you know, it's, it's not a question of being a trading partner. It's a question of really, um, it's not a question of, you know, doing business because it's a, it's a, it's a business, it's a, it's a relationship of convenience and importance. They have a resource and there's a need. And um, that's fine. Uh, the question is, to what effect is that need for that resource a dependent one? And how do you diversify that dependence? And is there any corruption or influence or otherwise relationship of concern regarding that, that relationship? And I think there is. Pleasure to, pleasure to meet you. My name is Ben Novak. Um, I've got a question for you regarding U.S. Hungary relations uh, in the context of your organization's role in U.S. Hungary relations. Um, American Hungary, the Hungarian American Coalition is a U.S. based organization. Um, it is also a member of the Magyar Diaspora Tanács, a government created entity of some sort in Hungary. And um, there's this, uh, I, I saw a document. It's this Alapito uh, Nyilatkozat, essentially out, it's like the modus operandi of the Magyar Diaspora Tanaj. And I, I just uh, want to cite something here. It says, uh, one of the roles that these organizations who are members of the Diaspora Tanaj do is uh, they help in the Magyar Állásport és Érdekek Összehangolt Képviseletének Kidolgozását in foreign media and in foreign uh, policy makers circles. Um, earlier, you had mentioned that one of the uh, concerns that you personally see with respect to U.S. Hungary relations is that the U.S. hasn't been putting enough attention on Hungary. Um, would your organization's role in the diaspora, Donaj, somehow try to influence the U.S. government's foreign relations with respect to Hungary? Um, the easy answer is no because uh, we've never, there's never been anything really that's come out of the communique um, and, the, and the, the conference begins tomorrow, uh, which my colleagues will be participating in. I unfortunately have other responsibilities. The communiques are largely a unifying document on what the diaspora in general will do to support you know, the broader Hungarian nation. Um, and obviously as a US 501c3, uh, which is a, a legal structure. We have very uh, strict parameters on what we can and can't do. Um, and we're, we're very diligent in what we do and how we do it. Um, and we disclose everything that we have you know, on our website, uh, you know, when we receive money and how we receive money, look at the tax returns and all these things. Transparency is the easiest way to not get into trouble. Um, and, um, but part of what we we do as a 501c3 and this legal entity is to educate and inform. You know, there's this kind of dirty word that's really not understood in Hungary very well. It's called lobbying. And the lobbying is something that's misunderstood here about what it's done there. Um, and you know, a registered lobbyist is a completely different thing than a 501c3. You know, we can only spend a certain percentage of our time and our resources um, on trying to influence or inform uh, and educate people on what we believe our position to be. Um, and certainly with regard to um, the Hungarian government, I don't think anyone could, 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 could accuse us of being you know, pro fides or you know, I was chastised for being Know, anti fides before they came to power, and now I'm, I'm chastised as being pro fides. You know, so you know, either way, you're going to get turned the arena, you're going to get thrown on the rocks. You know, it's all the same. I think the question really is where is the real substance of what you do and, and how you do it? Um, the diaspora, for example, I think is a, is a wonderful mechanism that the Hungarian government should be commended for, 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 for using the mechanism. Uh, that including, and that and the Maya as well, for the, for the Carpathian Basin. And um, for investing in uh, Hungarian communities around the world. Um, it's a way to reunite a fragmented nation that is in many ways a victim of you know, historic uh, challenges, uh, 
uh, either self-inflicted or inflicted on them. And our community is stronger and also more appreciative of what the government, this particular government, because it's the only Hungarian government that's ever done this, um, has done in terms of reaching out to us and making us feel part um, of, of, of what uh, we hope Hungary can be and, and should be. Uh, I'm just a quick follow-up question. Um, the the DS Tanach is a very interesting entity in and of itself, especially as it concerns itself with how Hungary is seen from other countries, from countries where there are Hungarian diaspora communities. I'm from America. I was born there. My, Hungar my parents are Hungarians. Um, one of the very interesting things that I've noticed is that the, the Dias Tanac, as an organization that clearly has a, uh, we, let's not call it political for the sake of discussion, but a cultural um, mission in uh, diaspora communities uh, around the world, that the Dias Tanac was uh, quite selective in how member organizations were chosen to take part in it. So who was actually selected? I know a number of uh, Hungarian organizations in the United States that were not selected, and these organizations uh, typically um, have a pretty like firm stand on wanting to stay out of the Hungarian political arena, or they have voice concerns with respect to this current government, whereas organizations from the United States that are members of the Diaspora Tanac, um, they have taken pretty serious stands with respect to the current domestic policies in Hungary. Right. Um, how was your organization selected to be a member of the Diaspora Tanash? Uh, well, we're pretty much the largest organization. I mean, we have, we're, we're a coalition of, of, of organizations. Uh, and we represent a constituency of member organizations from the scouts to different churches to cultural institutions to human rights organizations. And as a result of our, our, our presence in Washington and the things that we do, and we have done since uh, since our inception um, uh, nearly 24 years ago, I think, um, uh, we were asked to, to play a role. Um, I went to the one last year, but I didn't go to the first two, uh, and I'm not participating in this conference tomorrow. But, um, uh, I mean, anyone in, who knows our organization knows, you know, that I have different political views than many of our fellow board members, um, and we often enjoy battling it out. And you know, it's a free country, and you know, if someone has a problem with my private view, I, that's fine. But as an organization, we very, very infrequently get involved. Um, I think if you look closely at our record, especially it's just the area of statements, it's not our really our practice to kind of issue statements. You know, especially, you know, we don't shoot first and ask questions later. We're very, very careful about issuing statements with regard to Hungary, and certainly about internal policy. What I've stated tonight is far more detailed and probably far more critical about the U.S.-Hungarian relationship than I have in my entire tenure as president of the Hungarian American Coalition. Um, but the last time we issued a statement, which is very difficult because all of the uh, board members have to agree to language. So you can imagine it's like herding cats. So uh, that's a challenging thing and something that I would avoid at all costs. The last time we did it, though, I think was a year and a half ago, I think. And um, we did it on the issue of, 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 of expressing concerns over the, the, the balance uh, or the lack of balance in reporting on what was going on in Hungary by certain Western media. And the lack of balance we saw also in US foreign policy towards, um, towards Hungary when it was not applying the same kind of criticism towards Romania or Slovakia. You know, it would um, come out publicly against the language law in Slovakia, for example, or the issue of minority uh, concerns in, uh, in, in Wojvodina or in you know, in, in Transylvania. Um, and we found that to be unfair. So, um, and, and I think even if you look at that statement, which you can find on the website, it's pretty tame compared to, you know, some of the, 
you know, flame throwing stuff at other organizations do. Uh, we try to be respectful and sensitive to the fact that we're trying to play the role of an objective third party advocacy organization that promotes Hungarian culture and education and it also has an interest in the strength of Hungary's ties with the United States and Hungary's economy and its ties with the American economy. And our mission statement is very clear. And I can assure you that if I deviate from that, I hear about it from our board way before I hear about it from someone from the press. So I hope that helps. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm happy to follow up later. Hi, my name is Christoph, and um, you're on the list. Yeah, I'm on the list. <laughs> so my question would be: Your last words were that uh, you are optimistic that Hungary has a bright future. Uh, could you please elaborate that a bit? Because, like me working here, especially graduated at Corvinus, I don't see it that way. Yeah, it's it's easier for me to say. You know, uh, sure, of course. Um, I think it's a sense of long-term optimism. There are certain things that really trouble me, uh, uh, like the growing inequality, income, income inequality, uh, and, and Hungary, the issue of corruption, certainly, and obviously the issue of uh, I think the 70 percent increase in uh, uh, child poverty and children going to sleep hungry at night. So we're involved in, and I'm just personally involved outside the organization, involved in that, that issue. So there's, that, that, those are real, you know, serious issues that, that, that concern me. But um, I feel, you know, uh, Hungary is a pretty resilient place, and, and the Hungarian people are, are resilient, and they've proven so uh, in over a thousand years. And so, um, you know, I bet on the long game. And, you know, in my business, you really can't afford to be a pessimist. Uh, you can't be a blind optimist, but you can't be a pessimist. Um, uh, we have time for one more question. All right, so if there are no more questions, we would like to thank you for coming and giving this lecture. And I would like to draw your attention to two of our upcoming lectures. One of them is tomorrow, it's about India, and after it we have a wine tasting event. And the next one is about um, cybersecurity, it's next Wednesday. For further information, please visit our website, which is www.ajpk.hu. Thank you for coming. Thank you.